Good morning, Christ Community Church and friends. We are gathered here together today to worship our great God, the God Almighty, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So as we move into worship, um, let us give our hearts to Him and let us praise Him. Before we move into the call to worship, though, let me draw your attention to a few announcements. First of all, as you know, on our website, you can access a bulletin as well as some sermon notes that you can follow along with the sermon this morning and follow along in our worship. Also, we want to thank you, uh, members of Christ Community Church, for giving so uh, generously to the Deacon's Fund this weekend or this past weekend. So thank you for doing that. And please do continue to pray for one another and let us know of any needs that you may have. So as we prepare our hearts this morning, uh, let's spend just a few moments in silence uh, preparing our hearts, getting our minds right, and setting our eyes on Jesus. Would you stand with me, please? Would you stand as we are called to worship this morning? From the psalmist, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in Him because we trust in His holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. Shout for joy in the Lord. O oh, ye righteous, praise, benefit, and the upright, give thanks to the Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you.
with me. Oh, Father, be pleased as we come before you this morning. Let us sing in our hearts to you and make a joyful noise to you, for you are the rock of our salvation. We come into your presence with thanksgiving, with hearts of songs and praise, for you are our great God, our great King above all. In your hand, are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains, the vastness of the seas. All of it is yours. Every square inch because you fashioned it by your great wisdom. And so to you, our creator God, our deliverer, our savior, we come, we worship and bow down, we kneel before you, our Lord, our God, our maker. For you indeed are the Almighty One who is and is to come. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to our Old Testament reading this morning, we are going to be reading from Micah chapter 7. Micah, Micah chapter 7, verses 18 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham, as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. This is the reading of God's holy and glorious word that he has given to us. As we think about those words of forgiveness, as we think about how God has dealt with our sin through Jesus Christ, we now have an opportunity to come and to lay out our burdens before Him, to confess our sins, and then to repent of our sins as we do that. And so would you pray with me now this prayer that's printed in the bulletin, and we'll spend a few moments in silence uh, before Him, uh, asking Him to look into our hearts and to bring the confessions that we need to bring to Him, that we might be free. Would you pray with me? Loving Father, be merciful and forgive our sin. Cleanse our unrighteousness. Heal our hurts. And reconcile our broken relationships. Pour your spirit unto us with renewing grace. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Forgive our excessive drink and ingratitude. Make us thankful people with charitable hearts who drink from the well of your grace that this broken world would taste the new wine of the gospel. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
hear the offer of forgiveness that we receive through Christ Jesus and receive his grace. The Lord, your God, is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Let us now stand and rejoice in his forgiveness as we sing the song of rejoicing. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchased of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture, now burst on my side. Angels descending, free from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect As we come to affirm our faith, we affirm our faith in this great and wondrous creed of old, the Apostles' Creed. Would you affirm your faith? Brothers and sisters in Christ, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we continue our worship this morning through, give, uh, through giving, um, I would ask you again to consider how the Lord has been good to you this week and how He is always good.
Amen. Let us pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, um, we come to you this morning in prayer. We pray for the church and this world that we live in. We pray knowing that you are our good God and that your grace and salvation um, are real and alive in our hearts. And so we come in confidence. As you have promised, Lord, uh, we pray only in Jesus' name. And so hear us now. Hear us as we pray here in heaven. Hear our prayer and our plea. For those in need, Lord, we lift them up. And the poor and the hungry, the homeless and the unemployed the sick and the lonely, those hit by storms and other natural disasters across this globe, those in fear and those impacted by this virus. We pray, Lord, that all those in need, all those uh, issues and struggles that we haven't even uh, unpacked here, Lord, may all who are in need of you, receive the right help at the right time in their distress and find real relief. We especially want to lift up to you our own, in our own church, Lord, our brothers and sisters in Christ, too, who really and truly do need you. Father, we lift up Jacob Thonin, we lift up Nancy Rife. We continue to lift up Mike Bidding as he heals. Lord, heal these folks that we love so very much and care for them and watch after them. Father, we also pray for just many extended family members of those within our church community. Father, many are suffering now. Many are in need. Some of them dire need. And so hear them. Give them uh, your help and your relief. Father, we also lift up our missionaries who are scattered throughout this globe. We pray for those who have not yet believed, including the very important people are on our own personal list that we pray for daily and weekly. Lord, we pray for all those in spiritual need. Even for those who have stumbled and fallen. Bring them all to the gospel. The gospel hope and comfort that they can only find in Jesus. Father, we pray for peace and security of the nations of this world. For the end of war and violent oppression. And for the end of exploitation and eradication. That there may be peace in our times so that the people of this earth may receive the Prince of Peace. Lord Jesus, thy kingdom come. 
We pray for our own country, Lord, for those who govern and misgovern, for all those people, freeborn, foreignborn, and unborn, that they may have justice and security and well-being. And we continue to lift up those um, in, in the food industry, Lord, who need uh, your guidance and your help at this time. Uh, Father, care for our needs and then help us not be blind to the desperate that need help all around us. Father, uh, for you alone and to you alone we pray. Um, we pray especially right now for your one and holy Catholic Church the church that believes in the truth that the apostles taught. And it goes well beyond the, the borders of our own denomination. When we pray for pastors and leaders, we pray for the people who are a part of your great and glorious church throughout this globe, that they may be faithful to your word and prove to be in Christ as a light of the nations of this world. Uh, we pray for our own congregation. For our elders and deacons. And for those who give their time and toil to serve in various capacities. Uh, we lift up the music team to you now Lord. And we thank you for them. And we pray for those who serve quietly unobserved. Um, Lord may you bless them as well. Uh, Father, uh, may we and all we do glorify you in word and deed that you may be seen as a great light in this church, in this community. We pray all these prayers in the name of Christ. Hear our prayer and our plea. In his name, amen. As we come now to our time of um, being in the Word, uh, let's open our Bibles, please, to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, and we'll be in verses 19 through 24 this morning. 19 through 24. I remember as a, as a young um, believer, uh, first, I'd first come to Christ and and I wasn't sure what it was all about, and I, I started going to church. And I and I remember as um, as I would go, we would go and 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 open up our hymnals. It was a Baptist church in North Carolina. We'd take the hymnals uh, in front of us, would open them up, and and we would sing that song that we sang just a few minutes ago, "Blessed Assurance." Uh, you know the, the words, right? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. But what do we do? What do we do when we begin to sing that hymn or, or maybe we open our Bibles or perhaps we wake up in the middle of the night and we, and we wonder, is Jesus really mine? Do I have blessed assurance? Well, as we've been going through this letter, John wrote this letter to assure believers that they may have eternal life. And throughout this letter, as he has uh, set it out before us, he's given three tests for what a Christian truly is. And that is one who believes in Jesus Christ as, as the one who came in the flesh, God in the flesh. And that by believing him and in his works, that we would live out of his righteousness. Uh, it's, it's almost as if he's saying, if you know me, you will show me. And that's exactly what he's doing. And the third test that we have that he lays out for us is that we would love other believers. So if we're to break that down, we would see again, we know, we show, and we love. 
even with this desire to encourage, John realizes as he's riding along that sometimes true believers really begin to struggle and they begin to doubt that perhaps he realizes in writing this letter in this way that his beloved children may have issues in hearing this that drive them to ask the questions that we do when we're doubting. You know, is Jesus really mine? Do I obey as I should? Do I love my brothers and sisters in Christ as I could? Well, he, our passage this morning answers these important questions. So let's look at 1 John 3, uh, 19 through 24. By this, we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandment to do what pleases Him. And this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He has commanded us. Whoever keeps His commandments abides in God, and God in Him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you so much for your word this morning. I want to ask that you would be with us and enlighten this passage that we may um, know you better. And help us to, to understand what it what it is that you're trying to communicate to us about the gospel and our own hearts. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, our focus this morning um, is going to be on this idea that John offers gospel reassurance to us by encouraging us in Christ. I mean, that's the simple message of this text. So let's unpack uh, John's message and consider these three encouragement or these two encouragements. The first encouragement is is encouragement for condemned hearts, and then secondly, encouragement for confident hearts and its blessings. So as we look, first of all, at the encouragement for condemned hearts in verses 19 and 20, John begins by pointing out the real need that we have uh, that will just come on us all of a sudden. It's right there, verse 20. Look at it. Whenever our hearts condemn us. Notice, he doesn't say if ever, but he says whenever our hearts condemn us. Now, I, I have noted before that it appears that the false teachers that he has been writing against in the letter have been teaching that they knew the truth by some sort of special uh, inner insight, some sort of inner revelation. Um, again, John has countered this by noting that the marks of a true Christian is a lifestyle of biblical, moral character and good deeds that grow out of our commitment to belief in Christ Jesus. However... We see that in our desire to live such lives, we, we fail, and sometimes we fail miserably. Uh, we will even fall short of our own ideas of good lives, much less God's. So in our hearts, um, as they convict us and they bring us, you know, just in our minds, it'll bring us to a place where we're standing before the Lord and, and, and he'll bring us into his courtroom. And there's, there's this thing that plays out in our minds like this, this mock trial before the God Almighty. And in this mock trial, we can hear, you know, the condemnation that's poured down upon our hearts. And, and again, we'll wrestle through those questions. Is Jesus really mine? Do I obey him as I should? Do I love my brothers and sisters as much as I could? And the obvious answer is no, no. But even in this, there's a little bit more going on in this text. That it is actually a deeper issue. Uh, James Boyce reminds us of, an, of these deeper issues at play when it comes to the trial in our own hearts. Listen to what he says. 
He says self-condemnation can be due to a number of factors. It could be a matter of disposition. Some people are just more introspective and melancholy than others. It may be a question of health. How does a person, how a person feels inevitably affects how he thinks. It may be due to specific sin. It may be due to circumstances. But whatever the cause, the problem is a real one. And widespread. And so he leaves with this question. How is a believer to, um, to deal with such doubt? Well, at the end of verse 20, John graciously gives us a gospel remedy. And it actually comes in two parts. It comes in a reality that we must face and a grace that we must embrace. First, we must face the reality at the end of the verse. Look at it. God knows everything. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. Does that frighten you? That God knows everything about you. When I was thinking of, about this, I, I, I was remembering a story uh, from John's Gospel. And, and actually, we touched on it in one of our evening devotions. I think actually Chuck touched on it in one of our evening devotions a couple weeks ago. And, and if you remember, Jesus is it's in the early book of John. And the, the disciples are traveling uh, from Jerusalem to Galilee. Except Jesus decides to go through Samaria. And so the text says that uh, the disciples went off to get some food in Samaria while Jesus sat beside, sat beside a well. And when it was about the sixth hour of the day. And a, a, a woman comes along, a Samaritan woman. Now, everybody reading the story knows that she's coming along that side of the, that time of day because... Um, she doesn't have a good, a good relationship with other people in the village, especially the women. And so Jesus starts a conversation with her. And the conversation ensues, and it's kind of a tit-for-tat conversation. And, 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 it, and he begins to press a little bit and to press a little bit more until he comes down to verse 16 of John chapter 4. And this is what Jesus says. Jesus says to her, go call your husband. And come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one you have now is not your husband. Jesus went deep. He penetrated her heart and her mind. And she exclaims, this is true. I perceive you're a prophet. And then he says that, that. This is just so amazing. I am the Messiah. The Christ. It's interesting because as the disciples are coming back. She leaves and she goes off back to Samaria. To the village there. And she tells the people these words. Come and see this man who told me everything that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? You know, I've always wondered in that conversation, um, was there a little more to the all I ever did? It just seems so striking that she would say, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Was there more to this conversation that wasn't recorded? Or is it just the fact that the, this penetrating conversation was all she needed to get the point? And so I ask you, what is your everything? What is your all? Does your heart condemn you? When you read that story in John chapter 4 and you think about it, does her heart condemn her? Think about the conversation again. Because this is the more important question. Did Jesus condemn her? Did he put her on trial? Did he stand before the Father and say, this woman has done this and this and this and this? 
And he did not. And yet, he knew everything. In his words and actions, though, he revealed to her just what John reveals to us in the first part of this verse. The grace that we must embrace is that God is greater than our own hearts. Think of it. God is greater than our own hearts. So what does this mean for those who are in Christ Jesus? It reminds us that sin and condemnation that comes from our hearts can't stand against the mercy and the grace of our loving Savior. It communicates that we can trust that the gospel always, and listen to this, the gospel always has the last word. God is greater than our hearts. The next thing we see here is an encouragement for confident hearts and, and the blessings that come from that. In verses 21 through 24, we have seen that the remedy of the gospel leads to confident hearts. But here in verse 21, we read, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, whatever we ask, we receive from him. So John is, in a way, taking us, he's taking us by the hand and he's reminding us that the Lord would have us trust in Him. Not in our consciences, not in our, our circumstances, not in our obedience. He is reminding us of our position in Christ and in light of that, our position that we can approach the Father with boldness of prayer. That we can be confident that He hears us. Now, I don't know about you, but it's taking me a lifetime to get this. Several years ago, I was at a youth conference and, and one of uh, our friends came and spoke at, at this conference. Uh, um, it was one of the North Texas Presbyterian Youth Conferences. And I'll never forget, my friend stood up there and he said something that I've never forgotten, that I've always held on to, and that's this. I'm just beginning to understand the gospel. You know, it's the truth. I am just beginning to understand the gospel. Let me just give you an example. Let's, one example, preaching. Okay, There are some weeks, and I, and I have pastor friends that struggle with the same thing, so it's not like it's your pastor only that struggles with this. Everyone struggles with this in a certain way, and everybody has different struggles, and your struggles are going to be different too. But for preaching, I will be in my office, and I'll pick up my Bible, and I'll read like this passage this week. I'll read this over and over again. I'll break out the commentaries. I'll look at it. I'll think about it. I'll kind and make some notes you know I might get an outline you know the first day and I'm working through all these things and then it comes Thursday Thursday's sermon day and and I'll be working through the text in the morning I'm focused I turn my email off I turn my phone off I typically don't make um, you know appointments that day and I'll just get there and I'll look and sometimes it gets into the afternoons and I'm looking at a blank page. And I realize what I'm doing is, is that what you're trying to do, Patrick, is you're trying to use your meager giftings, uh, uh, your own power, um, your own strength to do this. And it hits me in the face. It's almost like the Holy Spirit goes, stop. Stop what you're doing and remember the gospel. Pray. It's not your message, brother. It's His. And I'll take a piece of paper and a pen and my Bible and I'll leave my commentaries and that blank screen uh, sitting there on the desk and I'll walk out and I'll either go for a walk or, or go in one of the rooms here. Sometimes I come sit right up here in the front row and I'll just pray and I'll say, Lord, I don't know what to say. I mean, this passage is clear, but I still don't know what to say. 
And his heart is always to say, ask me. Look at the scriptures. Sit before me and I'll give you the message. In these gospels, in the, I should say in these moments when the gospel really hits my heart, um, I realize that it's, it's a remedy. That it is what I need that leads to a confident heart. And, and that's what John is saying here. And, it, and he's saying this throughout this book. Is the remedy of the gospel leads us to confident hearts. And then to confident prayers. And the, real, the reality of that is, is it's because we're united to Christ. Even in our failures. And, and in our wrestling with our old sinful nature. Because he knows everything. Because he knows it all. And yet God is greater than our messed up hearts and our messed up desires. And so in the gospel I can trust him. And you can too and we can too. And our trust in God um, leads us to this wonderful benefit of prayer. And even in our prayer, it's like, you know, He sees again our sin. He sees our failures. But He not only sees that, He sees this, this fickleness and of desire in our hearts. These silly intentions. But His Spirit is so that He draws us in love. That He hears us. Because we please Him in Christ. And as we come to Him as in this childlike faith, um, the Gospel compels us to have childlike confidence in the Father. And it's not just any Father. We can't think earthly fathers because earthly fathers let us down. But this Father loves us beyond our wildest dreams. He cares for us. You know, he again, he could look past our silly, fickle desires and answer us. And so in that, it compels us to pray for things well beyond even our own understanding. I like how C.H. Spurgeon put it in his book on prayer. He said, Christ, or, or I should say, childlike confidence makes us pray as none else can. It makes a man pray for great things which he would never have asked for if he had not learned this confidence. It makes him pray for little things which a great many are afraid to ask for because they have not yet felt towards God the confidence of children. And so I ask you, is this your confidence? Do you know these benefits? And if not, John is he's compelling us to look no further than the gospel of Jesus Christ. For in and only in Christ will we have fruitful prayer. It always begins and it ends in the gospel. And I believe as we look around the rest of this text here, the passage elaborates further on this point. I mean, that's the whole point of the passage. Look at verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him. Why? Why? Because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. And this is His commandment that we believe in the name of the Son of Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He has commanded us. Whoever keeps His commandments, what does it say? Abides in God and God in Him. And by this we know that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. So you see the benefit of God hearing our prayers and answering our prayers according to His purpose, according to His glory, according to our good, is locked into that reality of our relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. To believe in Jesus, we have to think about it, to believe in Jesus is to receive Him as Savior and Lord. As God's anointed prophet, priest, and king. It is trusting Him as our only hope. Resting on the perfect sufficiency of His anointing sacrifice. And in the perfect righteousness of His obedient life as our covenant head. And so you see it's important, as John Stott notes, that obedience 
is the indispensable condition, not the meritorious cause of answered prayer. So we see here in the text that this, and it always is like this. Jesus said it was like this. The, you know, our belief in Christ Jesus has a natural outflow of love for one another. These two ideas stem from the same attitude of heart. And John sees them as one command. It's almost like he said, you can't have one without the other because that's what he's saying. Those who obey God's commands live in him. They abide in him. Similarly, if you flip over to John 15, uh, John there links abiding with obeying. The way we can know That he lives in us then. Is by the spirit that he gave us. God is greater than our hearts. So how do we apply this? You know it's it's just really simple. First of all believe. I mean believe that Jesus is the son of God. He is who he said he is. That he came. That he may ransom many of us. That he may deliver us from our uh, captivity to sin. and Bring us back into a right relationship with the Father. Believe that. Believe that he is who he said he is. And who the prophets and the apostles testify of who he is. The second thing that we can see here is, is that if our heart condemns us, believe <laughs> I mean, again, it goes right back to it. Believe. Go back to the gospel. Hold on to the gospel truth. And in that belief, realize who you are, that he sees you for who you are. And then confess your sin, repent, and and then leave that sin behind and come in confidence that he is greater than your heart. And thirdly, Enjoy the benefits of this relational reality that is expressed in the desire to know and please Him. Its outflow will be loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. It will be obeying His word and desiring to please Him. And if you're a believer in Christ Jesus and that's your heart, then He's looking not so much at your total obedience as at that desire That you have there. His grace is sufficient for us. So in that we can come to him with the benefit of of praying with confidence. Albertus Peters in his book. Divine Lord and Savior. Tells of a believer who was not well educated. But who had a deep assurance of his salvation. Everyone called this man Old Pete. And one day when he was talking to Dr. Peters, uh, he said, If God should take me into the very mouth of hell and say to me, In you go, Pete. That's where you belong. I would say to him, You're right, Lord. That's exactly where I belong. But if you're going to throw me in there, you better throw your son in there too. Because I'm so wrapped up with him. That I will never let him go. God is greater than our hearts. Hold on to Jesus. The Lord and the Savior. The King of all. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your love and mercy. That we have this this reality of the gospel that he came to redeem us that in him and in him alone are we kept so confidently that even when our hearts begin to doubt what your scripture tells us to do is to look to Jesus to look to him again and again and again And so, Father, help us. Help us, Lord. Give us the strength to look and to know that these things are true. Help us to hold on to Jesus. 
And to be so united to Him that we would never, ever, ever be separated. Oh, may it be. And Lord Jesus, come quickly that we would know it beyond hope, but that we would know it in reality. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together and let's sing our closing song. Would you stand with us that you would receive the benediction if you lift up your faces and your hands, receive it now. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God and Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen.